Stop. Stop. He never 
chapter 17 verses 10 says as soon as it was night the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea and on the way uh, on arriving there they went to, to a Jewish synagogue and now Berean Jews were, all, all, were more noble in character than those that were in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, and as did also a number of prominent Greek women and men also. I like this portion of scripture when it refers to the, to the Bereans. It says, and they received the message with eagerness, and they examine the scriptures. Amen. That means there, there is something that is important that we have to receive the message with joy. But the next thing we have to do is hold on to it. And the third thing we need to do is examine it for ourselves. Amen. Amen? That means after you go out of this place this morning, after your encounter with God, you have to go back, look at, uh, remember what you've received. And once you hold on to it, you've got to examine it. And say, God, is this what you're saying? And when they examine the scriptures, the fruit of the examining of the scriptures 
cause many of them to believe. I'm here to say to you, when you engage with truth, you cannot help but be changed. You cannot help but be changed. And I'm here to say to you today, this morning, put aside everything, every weight, every concern, every, every trouble, everything that is in your mind. And you just come before the Lord this morning. And you just say, Lord, I'm here to meet with you. I'm yet to just receive from you. And allow the Lord just to minister to you. Allow the Lord to just deposit in you. Allow the Lord just to speak to you. This is your time. You've come to spend time with your father. Amen. And when you're in your father's house, you try and grab as, as much as you can. And this morning, you don't have to grab for somebody else. You've got to grab for yourself. Amen. Amen. Because once you, you take it into your life, it will eventually change everything about you. It will change everybody around you. Amen. I'm yet to say to you, lives are going to be changed. Lives are going to be transformed Hallelujah. by what God is going to begin to do in your life. Amen. And Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray, oh God, give us the spirit of that, of, of the Bereans. Father, give us a spirit that eagerly pursues you. A, a, a spirit that, that uh, of discernment, a spirit of God, of, of, of righteousness, a spirit that causes us to passionately seek after you. And so we say, you oh God, this morning, touch our hearts with the things that touch your heart. Touch our hearts with the things that touch our heart. Oh God, I pray, oh God, let us not leave this place the same way we entered in. Let us leave this place changed and transformed. Saying, oh God, that surely, oh God, let, us, let others see it on our yes, face. Lord. That we spend time with God this morning. That we spend time in his presence. That God showed up that there's a ministry of grace. Because when Moses spent time in the presence of God, that it showed on his face that even they could not even look at him. And I want you to know today, this is God's desire. That every time you spend time in him, you should look better. Yeah. You should look different. Hallelujah. You should look more and more like him. That the Bible says that when, when we see him, we shall be like him. And so Father, bless us, O oh God. Our worship, our praise, our getting around the word today, O oh God. Let everything be done to, for your glory. This minister, this speak, this reveal your heart this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Amen. It's good to see all of you this morning. Amen. Let's just worship God together. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to praise God this morning. Amen. There's something right now that's bursting. There's a river that's flowing. And we want to jump into this river right now. Come on. Let's put our hands together. Yeah. Yeah. With all glory belongs to Him right now. Oh. Thank you, Father. Where goodness flows, there is a fountain that drowns, that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than the come on. the tide is rising. Yeah, right now, come on. Yeah. There is a current and it's stirring this so morning. Deep inside, it's overflowing from the heart of God, the flood of heaven, crashing over us. The tide is rising.
Set all the captives, set all the captives free. Spring up a well, 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 spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. Nothing can stop this joy. We'll be dancing, Lord. We'll be dancing in the street. Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well.
can do the impossible if we just believe and trust him amen oh we standing here this morning because we have a testimony amen you're standing here you're alive to tell of your testimony of your goodness of what god has done for you right now amen Whoa. i saw satan fall like lightning we saw darkness I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe I believe in signs and wonders Resurrection power I have resurrection power Still the miracle Still the miracle that I just can't get over testimony from death to life the great hero of my story I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony right now this is my testimony hallelujah oh your testimony so come together sons and daughters Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood, bought with blood and washed in water. And we're gonna sing the praises, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God, our God, will finish what He started. Oh, our God, our God, will finish what He started. This is, this is my testimony.
are still to come Lord your plans and the mandates for us oh God shall come to pass oh God oh you're the God that doesn't lie oh you're the God that's faithful is there anything too hard for you oh God nothing Lord and this is why Father we're standing right now giving you glory and honor oh God When you move, yeah. such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You're still showing up at the tomb, at the tomb of every Nazareth. Your voice is calling me right now. And right now, I
How much do you need him right now? I may not face Goliath, Lord. I may not face 
you know that God's faithful? That as he was with Moses, so he will be with you. As he was with David, whatever you're going to face, whatever giant comes in your way, whatever obstacle comes in your way, whatever destiny stealer, destiny killer that is in your way, God's about to move yeah. it. Amen. Hallelujah. And so this morning, I want you to begin to, to speak over your life that everything that is trying to rob you of that which is God's will for your life, God's purpose for your life, God's destiny for your life, you got to speak over your life. you got to own this. you got to begin to speak it. you got to begin to declare it. you be, you got to begin to believe it. God's going to move on your behalf. God, you are showing up. God, you are showing up on behalf of your sons, in behalf of your daughters, in the mighty name of Jesus. You are a God that is faithful, and there is nothing that is too hard for our God. There is nothing that is too hard for our God. Show up in the lives of your people. Where there is a need for healing, heal, Lord. Where there is a need for deliverance, deliver, Lord. Come on, somebody. Wherever there is a need for God to break through, We bless you, Lord. Paul writes a, a letter to, to Timothy, his spiritual son. And he says to, to Timothy, he says, Do warfare with the word that has been spoken over your life. That means some of you have just accepted this is my fate. This is my lot in life. This is, I deserve this. And I'm here to say to you, the Bible says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it sometimes even entered your own heart, your own mind, what God has in store for you. So don't let the devil tell you what God has in store for you. Because the devil is a liar. He's a manipulator. He's trying to steal from you that joy. He's trying to steal from you that plan. He's trying to steal from you. And I'm here to say to you, nothing that came down the bloodline, nothing that has been done by your, by your ancestors and those that came before you, your, your grandparents and great-grandparents is going to affect you. Because God's plan for your life will come to pass. God's plan yes. for your life will come to pass. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I've got to see it beginning to come to pass. I may not see him working, but I know that he's working. I may not feel that he's working, but I know that he is working. God's working it out for you. God's showing up on your behalf. God is showing up in your situation, on your job, in your workplace, in your home, in your family, in your children. God's showing up. Come on, somebody. I, I feel it in my spirit. If you've got to come in here, you've got to open up that door. You've got to say, God, I want you to come in. And as God begins to show up, I'm here to say to you, things are about to change about to transform in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So Lord, our response is like Mary. When the angel encountered her, she said, be it unto me according to your word. Because I know God's word will never return to him empty. Yes, Lord. It's going to accomplish. Yes, hallelujah. And what if God said it, he will do it. I'm here to say to you this morning, if God said it, he will do it. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we glorify your name. Father, we magnify you. For you are the king of glory. Show up in this place. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
Amen. And amen, 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 amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. It's so good to see all of you here in the house of the Lord this morning. And before, before I hand over to Pastor Wayne, there's just one thing that I need to do. Uh, we're honored to be requested by Pastor Wayne. This is his uh, recent book that he, he, he produced. This is the fourth book that he produced. So whilst in lockdown, he's been writing. Amen. And, uh, and uh, the Lord has been speaking. Amen. And I, w I just want to read a few excerpts for us as we, so we're privileged today to have the book launch in Potter's house. Amen. This is now, I remember we did the book launch for pondering also in the house. Amen. So we're blessed to also do this and we're honored to, to do this book launch. He, he writes in, he writes in, to, to the Almighty God, the sovereign creator of the universe, in Ephesians 4, 6. Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, who sits on the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for all the saints, to honor and uh, to the honor of the presence, power, and purpose of the Holy Ghost. He writes this, presence precedes power. Power produces witness. Witness proclaims testimony, and testimony prompts revival. Amen? Presence precedes power. Power produces witness. Witness proclaims testimony, and testimony prompts revival. We've been singing this morning, this is my testimony, from death to life. Amen? For well, Christ has rewrote our story, and and I want to just read another portion here. He says, in, in March 2018, in, the service, in a service in South Africa, the Lord planted a creative seed of, in, my, in my word womb. And that's a play on words. He is the creative force of creativity created creativity is first known is the first known attribute and he presented of himself in the beginning God created Genesis 1 1 and every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the father above comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no variableness neither shadow of turning James 1 17 God is the source of seed. Jesus is the nurturer through, through his mercy, grace, steadfast intercession on behalf of those who follow him. The Holy Spirit has served as a sort of midwife for the last three and a half years. Amen. And this is a, 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 the preface to, to the book. He, he speaks of how God is the creator. And the first known char uh, characteristic we know of God is that he is creator. Pastor Wayne, would, would you join me as we, we, we pray a prayer? And, and I pray that this will not only be that this grace that you're allowing us to participate in will also become evident in this house. That there will be writings and word that will come out of this. I pray that this will, will be a tool that will speak. that the Lord will begin to continue to minister to you and through you. This becomes a resource that will speak to generations. And one of the things I was, I was hearing of someone say the other day, you know, through your life you can tell stories. But through a book, you can leave stories. And everyone that opens the page gets an opportunity to glimpse and have, a, have, a, have an idea of how you encountered God. And that's my prayer. That they would not just read the words of the book, but they would receive the spirit in which God deposited this in your life. Can, can we just pray together? Can I ask you to stretch your right hand forward and even as we pray over this, Father, we thank you for your son. Thank you for the years of faithfulness 
Thank you that you have honored him in the way that he is able to articulate and to be able to communicate what you have revealed to him. And so I pray that this will not just become another book, but it will become a resource and a well that others will come and drink of. May it produce revelation that will ensure the, the development of the body of Christ. May it show, ensure that grace of God will continue, that others will be spurned on to continue the work. And I pray that even in the life of your son, may he be known in the gates of the city. May, he, may his works of God go before him. And may your God, the, the works of God create an audience. So, Father, I thank you for what you have placed in him, what you are, you are communicating through him. And I pray that for everyone that reads this book, now, Lord, we dedicate this book in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That which you have deposited, let it, O oh God, let it find room in many lives. And for everyone that is searching, let them find a resource that will help direct their steps. Take them further. Take them deeper in you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. I, I can tell you if you ever, if ever you've written something or you put out a paper, some of you know when you write out dissertations and you pour your heart into it. It's everything that is inside of you. And, and, and I think this is important for us that we would, we would begin to ask God to just create in us. And that's my, my prayer, that that spirit of creativity that God has placed in you will be transferred into generations to come. And when you look at it and you see it, you will say, this is, I have a, been a participator in this. Amen. Amen. Our Sunday school may leave, and uh, thanks to the worship team. Amen. Yes. Thank amen. You. I'm not uh, for for many of you that that, that that do not know Pastor Wayne Berry. He is no stranger to Potter's House. That's why no, no. he's just up here. Amen. Uh, <laughs> just up here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> amen. But uh, he's he's blessed us over the years. He's served over close on to 30 years as a worship pastor at Spring House from in Smyrna, Tennessee, uh, and. Uh, He's done many, many, he traveled throughout the nations, throughout Africa and other nations as well, really teaching the word of God. That's one of his, 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 uh, his pet peeves. That is the, the, the mandate that's over his life. And we are, we are grateful for what God is doing. So we receive you, sir, and share what the Lord has laid on your heart. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I thank Pastor Mom and, Mom and Pop over the house and all the other spiritual leadership in the house and you as a family, as a congregation, those that, of you that don't know my wife and I, Jean, just wave, let them know I didn't meet you in the parking lot. Uh, we've been married 42 years, so this woman is full of grace because she's been married to me for 42 years. Uh, but we consider you family. Um, one of the one of the main things that happened through the process of the pandemic is uh, the last time we were here was um, about this time three years ago, and the way the pandemic affected everybody on the planet, it it disrupted lots of things. And for us, what it did is it it broke a flow, or it put a pause in a flow that had been going on for 16 years. I'll 
I'm going to comment about that a little further into my teaching. Um, but we are humbled and honored and graced and favored to be here today because there have been some periods. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm a little bit undone. I'm actually, what I'm, I'm sharing what's on my heart, but I'm also kind of stalling for time because uh, that song, um, Testimony, those verses, Anytime someone writes, I'm also a composer and a lyricist, songwriter, and the, anytime I hear a song that has connectivity to the Old Testament, not about the Old Testament, but anytime, it, anytime the lyric moves the content of the Old Testament into a contemporary, contemporary setting, it kind of undoes me. So the fact that we camp there a while today um, has a little bit messed me up, so... I'm uh, it, uh, on, in broadcast. I'm stretching. <laughs> I'm stretching because there's time to fill. I'm not burning the time up. I'm just trying to get my equilibrium. So just bear with me for just a moment. Mm. In <coughs> October of 18, the government in the UK. Uh, secular government, not in the house, the government over the nation, over all the populace, redeemed and unredeemed, began to realize that there was a, a serious problem within the UK among the people. Uh, and this was the end of 18. So it was about r roughly about 18 months before the pandemic even began to stir on the planet. And the problem that they, they began to realize existed was there was a there was an aspect of isolation this is pre-pandemic there was an aspect of isolation and separation and restriction in the lives of the people especially the elder elderly and the young it was it was more identifiable with the elder the elderly population and with the youth wasn't excluding the middle age it just the numbers were showing them that there was a, a difficulty arising in the UK. So the government created a new category ministry-wise. Now in ministry, when I mention ministry in the house, everybody immediately is thinking minister and pastor. I'm talking about secular government. I'm not talking about Christian government or kingdom government. So the titles within the, uh, within the government in the UK is a minister of health, minister of finance, uh, uh, Minister of Education. So the title positions within the government has the word minister in it. And to begin to try and rectify or address the problem that they were realizing, they created a new category, a new title, a new position. And the position is called the Ministry or the Minister of Loneliness. The government of the UK actually has a governmental category to deal with loneliness. And this is pre-pandemic by about 18 months. I'd been dealing with hope and processing that and turning that over in my spirit for some time. So I would research and the Holy Ghost would put things in my path. And I came across an article that addressed this. And as I was reading it, I just began to weep in my study because I went, for, for a world government, a temporal government, a, co a government out of the house, to go, we need to do something about our, our people, meaning the residents, the citizens in the UK. We need to do something for our people to combat loneliness. And it undid me. Uh, and that's really where this teaching is coming from. Although the teaching is it's relatively new, it comes from several years of handling hope. I'm, I'm going to share with you briefly... Let me know when I have about 10 minutes, please. Uh, about building a bridge of hope. That's what I'm going to title this, just so you've got, you've got it on wherever you document it. Some of, I know you have a lot of note takers here, so we're going to talk about building a bridge of hope. I want to start with uh, the passage in Hebrews 11:6. If you can, oh, that screen went away. 
I think I'll get a screen here, won't I? Yeah, yeah uh, I know they have it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. They'll pull it up. I may have jumped ahead of you. Uh, the Hebrews passage says this, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, briefly, let me comment about this, because this all has to do with constructing the bridge. So what I'm really doing now is I'm digging holes and putting the footing in and beginning to lay a structure that will hold the bridge. So all of this is essential, it's necessary to the construction, which is where I'm headed. Note, note a couple of things about this passage. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, with that, without going into the Greek and without, you know, without you know, expanding and, and unpacking the way the language works, just deal with this biblically on a surface level. Just let it say what it says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In that phrase, there's no subtext. There's no parentheses. It's impossible to please God, parentheses, except when, dot, 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 close parentheses. It's not there. So what does the word po impossible mean? On a base level, it means it's impossible. It doesn't say it's impossible to love God. It doesn't say it's impossible to serve God. It doesn't say it's impossible to commit to God. It says it's impossible to please God. Am I louder now? I'm no, I'm I'm la I'm a little I'm a bit laid back. You know, like I said, the the worship and praise time un undid me a little bit. There you go. Now you found me. You in the back got me? Okay, good. I hear I hear myself coming off the wall back there. Uh, in fact, I live off the wall most of the time. Uh, just note the word seek. Okay, so if it's impossible to please God without faith. The next logical step, at least in my universe, is to determine what faith is. If I ask you, I'm not going to, I'm going to answer the question for you, but if I ask you to tell me what faith is, most of you, or many of you, based on your understanding and your relationship to the Word, would say this, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1, because that's the passage that defines scripturally what faith is. The verse itself is not problematic. The verse itself is sort of like the phrase, it's impossible to please God. Take it at face value. Take, don't, don't try and unpack it. Don't try and analyze it. Just realize that it's saying faith is the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> Here's the difficulty. M most of you, most all of us in the body of Christ in the last couple of hundred years <clears throat> have had much teaching, much insight, much revelation, much instruction about faith, what it is, how it operates, how important it is to live by faith and to believe by faith. And that's not wrong. That's scriptural because the New Testament is full of directives about faith and how it applies. So that teaching and that instruction, what you, what you carry that you believe about faith is really important. However, <clears throat> that passage in Hebrews 11.1 1, that defines faith says 
that faith is the substance and evidence of things hoped for. So this is what that says to me. Little, little hope, little faith. No hope, no faith. In other words, the presence of hope is required for any faith at all to be there. Without hope, faith can't manifest because the verse that we're looking at that tells us what faith is says it's the substance and evidence of hope being resident. So all the focus about faith, I've lost my faith, my faith is weak, I have the faith to move a mountain, all of that rhetoric, good, bad, right, wrong, up, or down, all of that rhetoric is essential. It's actually a requirement to nurture faith. But faith does not self-generate. For faith to function, hope has to be there first. Now, let me, I'm going to pick you. I'm going to pick you up in case we, in case there's stragglers along the way. Go back to where we started: the ministry of loneliness. Loneliness is so bumped up or connected or, uh, or yoked to hopelessness, loneliness and hopelessness. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does loneliness breed hopelessness? Or conversely, does hopelessness create loneliness? I don't know the answer to that. I just know that loneliness and despair and depression and hopelessness, the loss of hope, is rampant on the planet, and it's rampant in the church. And what I just said has nothing to do with salvation. I'm, I'm not addressing once saved, always saved, or how saved are you, or, you know, or what was the process of your surrender to the Lord. I'm not addressing any of that. I'm addressing hope. That's what I'm talking to you about. So, if it's, if it's a requirement for faith to be functioning in order to please God, then defining faith becomes critical to work out being pleasing to God. And if faith cannot exist unless hope is there first, the next logical step is to figure out what hope is. See, if I didn't do this, if I, if I wasn't working the language with you and we were just going to talk about faith, we could say a lot of things that are biblical. We might say stuff about faith that's not true at all. For example, if you say or someone said or you've heard someone say, my faith is shaky or I think I'm, I don't, I'm not believing in faith like I used to. If you've had that dialogue, if you've looked in the mirror and said that yourself, that's not in and of itself incorrect, but it's not complete because your faith can only be shakable when your hope is shakable. Yeah. So the point is not, can I live a life by faith? Yeah. I'm not dismissing that. I'm not dismissing living a life by faith. I'm saying based on Hebrews 11.1, 1, that in order to live a life by faith, I must have the presence of hope inside my spirit. Little hope, little faith. No hope, loneliness, hopelessness, depression, da-da-da-da-da. No manifestation of faith because the writer of Hebrews gives us our corporate definition of what faith is. But we focus so much on faith. I'm not deriding that. That's valid. But in the process of building up a history within the church at large about focusing on faith, we have minimized what the 
very passage says faith is. It's, I know I'm being redundant, but I'm doing it on purpose. Hope generates faith. If you've been praying, God, I need more faith in my life, you're praying the wrong prayer. If the faith in your life is diminished, it's because the hope in your life is diminished. So reshift how you pray for faith. You can't bypass hope. Hope is anticipation, expectation, or confident belief. Anticipation, expectation, or confident belief. That's uh, simply stated, that's the definition from Greek in the strong in Strong's Concordance. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's th that will give us enough to work with. And hope, based on anticipation and expe expectation and confident belief, hope. Listen, listen. Hope isn't here yet. Hope is not past tense. It's only past tense if you put an ED on the end of it. I hoped I hoped I would get here this morning. Past tense. Why is it past tense? Because I'm standing here. If I woke up this morning going, I hope that I get to share today. I'm now seeing my hope fulfilled because I'm standing in front of you. So hope is hope is always coming until it arrives, okay? But faith can't show up till hope arrives. Now, for 16 years, Gene and I have been coming to this continent every year, sometimes twice a year, until this time three years ago when the pandemic hit. When that took place, it shut everything down, and for us, one of the key things it shut down is being able to come to the continent of Africa. And for me, personally, saying that's disappointing is an understatement. And being disheartened by that was difficult. Wasn't mad at God, you know, wasn't looking for a demon under the rock. Uh, in terms of where the pandemic had come from, that's a side issue. All I knew was it's there's nobody's flying, N nobody's going through borders. People, this, people are <laughs> people aren't coming to church because <laughs> you can't leave your houses worldwide. So everybody became using an old king, uh, an old childhood memory. Everybody became shut-ins. Even if you were well and healthy and you, you know and vital, you were still shut in. So Gene and I weren't believing to come back to Africa. Because our hope was on pause. There was no way to exercise faith. Watch. We couldn't exercise our faith because our hope was on pause. So last April, make a long story short, last April, the pause began to release. And we started praying. We started setting resources aside. I started doing what I had been doing for 16 years. I started coordinating our schedule here from America to come here, here, literally, here, in this room. Uh, we began to work at, uh, in Johannesburg and here, and when we leave here, we're going to Bilawayo. This has been a pattern for 16 years. So how to redevelop that in light of what happened with the pandemic, we began to flesh out. So we applied faith to our resources. We applied faith to our calendar. We began to look at flights. We began to look at accommodations and transportation and 
uh, ministry opportunities and family time like we had out here last night with all this food. <laughs> That's really one of the key reasons we come to Durban is to be in Chatsworth and pig out. <laughs> uh, you all know what I'm talking about. So when paws begin to lift on our hope, we then started taking faith steps. It didn't require us to exercise faith when our hope couldn't be uh, functional. When hope, we had hope. We had resident hope, uh, anticipation, expectation, confident belief. Believing that hope would manifest, we had. But we couldn't help it manifest because faith is the manifestation of hope. You can't get to, I will walk this out by faith until you got hope to carry that. So we're standing here because the hope in our spirits manifested as faith and the mechanics of what we did brought us back to this continent. Now, what I just explained to you in terms of global travel and global ministry and coming back to this space applies to every day of your life every single day of your life because every place you feel in your spirit that you're to exercise some aspect of faith cannot be done until hope is resident. Okay, so the next question then becomes, where does hope come from? Because we, we, I've defined hope for you but I haven't said anything about where you get it. And I've said you have to have it before you can move in faith. Just a little amen, just a little one, just a little one for somebody. Amen. Thank you, <laughs> Pastor. <clears throat> in order to have hope that will generate faith, hope has to, you not only have to have it defined, what is hope, expectation, anticipation, it has to come from somewhere. In the same way that faith is not self-generated, hope is not self-generated. I couldn't sit in my study at home where we live and go, okay, come on, Holy Ghost, come on, Holy Ghost, give me the strength to manifest hope in my life because it's not my hope. Paul says, this is free, <laughs> Paul says, writing to believers, excluding unregenerates and pagans and heathens and agnostics and idler, uh, excluding all that, Paul is writing to us, and he says, if we, he includes himself, we, y'all in the South in America, y'all, <clears throat> usans, that's even more Southern. <laughs> if we have faith in this life only, we are of all men, women, people to be pitied. Now, the passage doesn't speak about the two aspects of hope, but there are two in that verse. He says, if all the faith to believers, if all the faith, I'm sorry, Hope. If all the hope we have is based on life here, we, believers, will live miserable lives. What? I'm saved, born again. I'm already living in eternity. Uh, my, f the favor of the Lord's on me and my destiny's in Christ Jesus. How can I be miserable? Ah, uh, it's quiet. It's not my language. The word miserable there is lacking compassion, unable to give compassion or get compassion. So if it has nothing to do with redemption, he's writing to the redeemed. He says in Wayne speak, it's possible to live on this earth a redeemed life and live with no compassion coming in and no compassion going out. 
Has anybody noticed how divided humanity is becoming? Has anybody noticed how confrontational people are becoming? Has anybody noticed the level of anger rising in humanity? Oh, you mean it's happening here? Did you know it's happening in America and China and South America and the UK? So it's possible to live a non-compassionate life and still be saved and spirit-filled. I didn't say it. Paul said it. But the implication in the text is if we have hope in this life only, this life only, this life only, what he's saying that the text doesn't say is there's a way to live with hope that's temporal, it's carnal, it's earth-based, it's time-driven, has a beginning, middle, and end. In other words, it's hope that only functions while you're here. But believers have the blessed hope, Christ Jesus. Titus says we're waiting, remember? Hope is anticipation. It's, it's not H-O-P-E-D. It's hope. It's present tense. We have hope that we don't see manifesting yet. It's the same hope that Gene and I had when we hoped, when we were hoping to return, but our hope was on pause. We're hoping he will return. We're anticipating it. We're expecting it. We are confident in that to manifest. But it's not manifested yet. So we're hoping for the hope we have in our blessed hope to manifest. So Paul says, you know, you can live as a believer. Uh, Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. I know you did because I'll hear you. He says to believers, you can live a life of hopelessness even though you're redeemed. Think loneliness. Think depression. Think bound up by no friends, no family, no contact with people. Think separation on humanity all over the earth. Think post-pandemic which is where we're living now. Paul says you can live your life here, temporal, with some hope, but it's not blessed hope. The separation point is Christians can function with two kinds of hope. Temporal hope. When Gene and I got on an airplane, we we let, we, uh, we, uh, a, a brother in the Lord drove us to uh, the airport near our home. We got on a plane for about two hours, left Nashville, went to New York, got on a plane and flew for four, about 15 hours from New York to Johannesburg. On that plane, which was full, no doubt in my mind, there were unbelievers and Christians on that plane. Inside, the unbelievers on that plane were hoping that plane wouldn't crash. We were hoping that plane wouldn't crash. We weren't nervous. We weren't frightened about flying. It's unconscious. We, we believed the plane would take us. That's faith. <laughs> so our hope was placed on the fact that we'll land in Johannesburg. But there were people on that plane with us that were internally concerned that the plane might crash. And if they crashed, not having the blessed hope in their life, then their hope is over. If the plane went down with Christians and unredeemed on the same plane and went down in the ocean, Gene and I would have gone up. Because we have hope in something other than this life only. Now, one of the reasons hope is being diminished the way it is and that the UK government started the Ministry of Loneliness is because hope, our hope, the church's hope, your hope, 
is leaking out. And here's the reason. Not going to talk about the devil. Not going to talk about temptation. Not going to talk about sin. It's leaking out because you've allowed your hope to be placed on things of this world. Because Paul says, if we have hope in this life only, talking to believers, we're going to live a compassionateless life. So what Paul is saying way back before the pandemic is this. If you Christians have misplaced your hope, you need to refocus where it belongs. Because the more hope you have about life here, the less you have for hope eternal. And it's not about redemption. He's not talking about losing your salvation. He, he's talking about living a spirit-filled, salvific life on this planet with less hope than you should have. Now, this is the reason I'm saying that. We're headed. We're almost, okay. If the church functions with hopelessness, how can our testimony, our witness, our evangelism, the Great Commission, church planting, leading people to Jesus, how can it ring true to those that don't have eternal hope if those that are supposed to be living with the blessed hope have allowed it to leak out. And that's the problem because we cannot advance the kingdom with all that that means. We cannot do it if the kingdoms we're concerned about are the ones we can see and feel and touch and taste. I know I get a little intense. It's an intense subject. Okay, real quickly, let me answer this. Where does hope come from? 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Now our, uh, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, past tense, and hath given us, um, King James, given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Good hope through grace. 2 Thessalonians 2.16, good hope through grace, preceded by saying, God has given us, past tense, we have good hope through grace. So the answer to where, great, where hope comes from is it comes from grace. Good hope through grace. And the next question, rounding a corner, the next question then is where does grace come from? Faith manifest out of hope, hope comes to us through grace. So where does grace come from? There's two functional kinds of grace. One is a huge category. One is a specific category. The first place that the small category shows up is when we're told by grace we are saved through faith. It is a work of God, not of us, so no man can boast. We are saved by grace. So when we come to Jesus, however we come, however we prayed it, we received grace, redemptive grace. It's a gift from God. We didn't do anything to earn our salvation. We didn't do anything to earn the grace gift that saved us. By grace, you are saved through faith. Faith could only manifest because of grace being there first. And what's missing between grace to the faith of manifesting is the word hope, is the condition of hope. Uh, the bridge is starting to appear, okay? In order for us to be saved through grace, we received redemptive grace. But grace as a subject is enormous. There are more ways for grace to manifest not gifted than we have time to process. But I can show you one place to appropriate grace. You were given grace to be saved, but Hebrews 4.16 says we can appropriate grace. Now, this will take about three minutes, and then I'm going to give you a visual, and we'll go from there. Real quick, come boldly before the throne of grace that you might 
uh, obtain mercy and find grace in your time of need. Or in time of need. I shouldn't have inserted your. Okay. So the passage, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to believers just like Paul has been speaking to believers. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an evangelical passage. It's an in-the-house passage. So when the writer of Hebrews says, come boldly before the throne of grace, he's talking, let me say it this way. Let, let, don't, I'm not the writer of Hebrews, but I'm saying it, so look at me. I'm saying we all can come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. You with, with me? It's, a, it's written congregation but it's speaking to you individually. You can come, you can come, y'all in the back can come, you can come before the throne of grace to receive, uh, um, obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. You, we can each do that individually, but the passage is calling us to, in fact, do that. Okay, stay with me, okay? It's calling us to do something to get it. So the implication is you can come boldly before the throne of grace or not. Nothing to do with salvation. He's writing to redeem. You have the choice. You have the option. You have the capability to come in prayer or meditation or how, however you flesh that out. You can get to, oh, Jesus, the throne of grace. My God. And it says, to obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. Now, when you read that passage, maybe before today, but right now and until I say what I'm about to say, you may read that passage and appropriate it for yourself. Because it says, obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. So if you do that, you're basically going, real simple, Father God, I'm, I'm, I come before your throne of grace, and I appropriate, I request, I solicit grace for my time of need. Whether it's a need, I'm like going, I need this bill paid, or whether it's I'm going to run into something today that I need to be able to cover with grace. That's not wrong, but that's not how it's written. It's written to all of us. So if I go to the throne of grace and I go, God, I'm appropriating grace to help me in my time of need, and while I'm there, please listen, while I'm there, could you give me an extra dose so I can carry that so when I go out into the world today, I've got grace to give to people I don't even know I'm going to meet in their time of need? Why is there so much loneliness? Why is there so much hopelessness? It's because the grace that we need to carry for ourselves and others, not just in the house, on the planet, requires, watch, it requires grace in order for hope to flow out of grace, which in turn will manifest faith to implement our hope, which we got because it flowed from grace, which we got at the throne of grace. Are you breathing? Yeah. The process there is a process that we need to activate. Well, pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying this. You are not praying for grace for yourself enough. And you are not praying for others to receive grace from your hand. because. It's in your hand because you appropriated it at the throne of grace. So I get it. I put it in my pocket. I put it here. I put it in my wallet. And I walk around with it, not going, who can I grace? Who can I grace? You walk around living your life. And somebody, one or more people in the course of a day, crosses your path, and you may never speak to them. It may be a flash prayer. You may catch somebody downcast and go, Lord, grace them in their time of need. Yeah. Listen, this is the point. Need is everywhere. Yeah. And we're here, what was, what was that for, uh, the, um, 
If I'm not dead, what? help me, the song we sung. If I'm not dead, I'm here. What is it? If I'm not dead, I'm not done. If I'm not dead, you're not. If I'm not dead, you're not done. He's waiting to pour out more grace when we request it. If we're not dead, he's not done. Okay, I need... I need a large guy. Don't, now, don't, don't get Indian on me, okay? Don't, don't all shy out on me. I need a guy with broad shoulders that's pretty tall. And what I'll do, rather than pick, I might pick you out or I might let Pastor do it because you'll submit to him and not, maybe not to me. I, I, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I just need a large guy. Like today, if we're going to have breakfast or lunch later, because I won't leave till I do this example. Thank you. Oh, you're ideal. Would you stand right here and face out that way? Now I need somebody between the ages. Oh, the kids left, didn't they? Okay. I need, I need one person between 20 and 30 today to come up here. Male or female, doesn't matter. Come over a little bit right there. Please, I need somebody between 20 and 30. Somebody. Today, <laughs> I've been in this house before. <laughs> Thank you. Now, let's see where I want you. I want you there, this, line, this sort of line up. Okay. Now, I need one more person. It needs to be female. It needs to be between 30 and 40. Please, today. <laughs> we won't leave. I've done all that to get to here. I need a female between 30 and 40 to just come stand right here. What? No. I, I, ah. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you can bring the baby. You, you, know, you know me and babies. No, come on. Okay. Now. Oh, wait. No, right here. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a visual example for you visual learners. But one of the things I've learned teaching over the years is even if you learn by reading or, or you know, or study, you know, or, or you just get a Holy Ghost download, you can still retain information when you see it visually, even if that's not your learning skill. So it's not wasted on anybody. So, some of you will remember what I'm about to do more than anything I shared. So that's why I'm doing it. Okay. In order for faith and hope and grace to follow that cycle, to follow that river, to follow that process, there has to be a bridge between grace and faith. And that bridge is the bridge of hope. So if hope flows out of grace, actually come this way just a little. If hope flows out of grace, Hebrews 4.16, come boldly before the throne of grace that you might appropriate grace and mercy. And 2 Thessalonians 2.16 says we receive hope through grace. This grace needs to attach to the bridge of hope. So grace flows into hope and then hope manifest through <clears throat> what I just taught is right there. You can't get from here to here without this. You can't get from here, faith, to grace without here. Thank you. Thank you. In order for grace and hope and faith to function biblically, because what I just built, I built from Scripture. I didn't make it up. 
I, how I presented it may be awkward for you. If you don't think what I said is right, then you need to take that up with the passages I just read because that's where I got them. I didn't make any of this up. I, I grounded you in the, t I know this house. I grounded you in the teaching from Scripture so that you would see something you may not have seen. And this is the reason I did it from where I started. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you can't get faith without hope, and you can't get hope without grace. And the grace that saves you, you got for free. But all the other grace that comes to your life, all the other grace can come multiple ways. You don't have to request all other tons of grace that come to you that you never do anything about. This is important. I'm through. Grace can come at you out of nowhere, completely unexpected, undeserved the same way that the grace that saved you as a gift. But you can still get grace. Grace is just everywhere. But Hebrews 4.16 says you can get grace if you go to where grace is and request it. The more we activate that, the more God will use us to deal with loneliness and desperation and hopelessness and failure and suicide and mental illness. And in the process of doing that, if you don't think that will please God, you're mistaken. I'm done. I thought, oh, did I miss praying? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, 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 Father God, in the name of Christ Jesus, mm, through the presence and the power and the purpose of the Holy Ghost, I ask you to wrap your loving kindness around our lives, renew our minds, soften our hearts, liberate our spirits and regenerate our souls for the sake of your kingdom and its advancement on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that in our blessed Savior's name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.